The current healthcare system isn't about health, wellness, and longevity. It's crisis intervention and revenue generation. Lee and I came together with this passion for better nutrition, proper exercise, the importance of sleep and community engagement. Welcome to the Crisco & Company podcast. Today, we're really fortunate and thankful to have Dr. Brooke Goldner as our guest. Dr. Goldner is a medical doctor who stumbled into a plant-based diet a number of years ago and by surprise, ended up curing her own lupus. So we're really keen on hearing her story. She's the author of three books, uh, Goodbye Lupus, Goodbye Autoimmunity, and a uh, green smoothie recipe book. I've read all three books and I'm really impressed and I'm really excited to talk to Dr. Goldner. So Dr. Goldner, how are you? How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. That book's Goodbye Autoimmune Disease, by the way. Oh, what did, oh, what did I say? Goodbye Autoimmunity. Autoimmunity. Okay. Just in case somebody was looking for it. Okay, know? sure, sure. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I was really fascinated by your books and um, mm -hmm. I actually, uh, we, we talked a few weeks ago and uh, we've got a bumper crop of kale out in our garden. So I've been on a oh, green cool. smoothie kick and uh, it's really interesting. I've got a little bit of plaque psoriasis on my elbows. It's never really bothered me, but it's almost completely gone just in the last couple of weeks since I've been doing the green smoothies. So right, it's uh, miraculous, right? It just Yeah, it's them. incredible. The medicinal <laughs> power of food is incredible. But, uh, you know, tell us, how did you stumble into this whole plant food lifestyle? And tell us all about it. Yeah, so I, uh, I never uh, knew that it was a thing, honestly. Mm -hmm. I'm a scientist. I was first doing genetic research and then went into medicine. And yeah, I was uh, never looking for the natural solution to anything. I never even knew it just kind of happened by accident. So, so my backstory is that before I was a doctor, I was a patient and I was diagnosed with lupus back when I was 16 years old. And back then, so this was 30 years ago, it's actually 30 years ago since I was diagnosed with lupus. So, um, wow. and back at the time they gave me six months to live. So I like counting how many years I'm still here. 30 years ago, they gave me six months to live and I'm still kicking. Um, wow. But it was really serious. I was very, very sick. So I had a lot of more typical symptoms, you know, the rash across my face. I had migraines. I had arthritis. But when they brought me to the hospital and I was diagnosed, uh, I was also having kidney issues. And so they had me do a kidney biopsy right after my hospital visit. And right after that ended up in the nephrologist office. And he's the one who said, you know, you have the most aggressive form of lupus nephritis, which is lupus and autoimmune disease attacking your kidneys. And he said, with how severe it is right now, if we don't do something extreme, like an experimental type treatment, that at best you have six months before a complete kidney failure. And that could mean that you don't make it or at best hope dialysis. So it was, uh, you know, it was a really hard time. I remember being in that appointment and, you know, I didn't like having arthritis and rashes, but I'd never really thought that I had something deadly. Who thinks those things? And I was at that appointment with my mother and my grandmother, who's my hero, and she's a Holocaust survivor. And it was this devastating moment uh, where we got home and I, I remember, you know, my, my grandma has always been really like tough and amazing. I've never seen her cry. Not even when my grandfather died of lung cancer, she didn't cry. But that night she cried and, and she was on her knees in my kitchen, crying to God, begging him to take her life to spare me. And, and you know, it's one of those things where I, I tell my patients all the time that it's important for you to understand that disease is not something you experience alone that it hurts the people who love you too. And it's one of the reasons you need to fight for yourself, that people love you and they need you to be okay. And now that I'm a mother, I realize my mom freaked out way more than I did because I was just like, okay, this is what I have to do. Let me deal with it. And thankfully back then, I don't know if you remember those days, we didn't have the internet. Uh, there was no Google. Um, yeah. And so I didn't, I was kind of, uh, free of that, I think protected in some ways. I never Googled it. You know, there was no Google. And my, my son Solomon calls it the dark ages because we had no Wi-Fi. But my mom gave me a book once on lupus. I started reading it, found it depressing and threw it away. So I just decided I was going to focus on my life. I would 
do the treatments I had to do and then just try to live a normal life as much as possible and not be in a moment, a state of dread and, and fear. And, um, and that, that was really important for me and something that I teach people to this day, even as I'm helping them get healthy. So for me, that's always been the focus. I, I did the experimental treatments back then that was, um, chemotherapy, high dose steroids. Uh, I took about seven pills a day. Uh, in addition to having monthly chemotherapy, all designed to shut off my immune system. That was the goal. If your immune system is attacking your kidneys, if we shut off the immune system, we could save the kidneys and maybe it will reboot. Like when your computer just stops working, Zoom's cutting out. What do you do? You just shut it off. You count to 20, you say a little prayer, then you turn it on and boom, everything's working. So they kind of tried to control, delete or restart my immune system. And it was effective. It's it's a scary thing to do because, you know, I remember walking around with you know walking pneumonia for six months. I I couldn't heal a pimple without it turning into a big wound that that had to be lysed open. I mean, my immune system really wasn't working, and I was going to high school, um, but I got through it really just believing that I would, and that you know holding on with everything I had to what made me feel like a lucky person. So my grandmother was my great role model for that because even being a Holocaust survivor, she would always tell me what a lucky girl she was. Up until she she lived in 99 as a lucky girl. And if she could be lucky because of what she had rather than what she suffered, then so could I. So again, it wasn't like I was looking for a natural way. I don't want to use chemo. Give me the, no. What, I was an, from an immigrant family. You do what your doctor says. That was it. There was nothing else. My grandmother had a, a fourth grade education you know, my mom came to, to the U.S. As, an, as a, you know, they were refugees from the war. So she was born in Poland after the war. She was a little girl when they came here. She did go to college uh, in Queens, but, you know, it's still, it was just, you do what your doctor says. So really the reason I stumbled into this had nothing to do with any foresight or search for information like many people who find me and I suspect you as well, but really that I fell in love with an incredible man uh, I went on a diet to lose weight for our wedding. Uh, and the diet just so happened to be the first iteration of what became the Goodbye Lupus Protocol. And, and that came from my husband's work. He's a scientist himself who was trying to figure out the optimal human diet for fat loss and muscle building, because obviously humans have forgotten it. Why do we know what every species eats and not our own? We, we, we think that we're biodiverse. We think some humans are carnivores and some are, it makes no sense. So he just wanted to figure out for physique only, not for health. He didn't think he could impact health. Physique only, what is the optimal diet? And when I followed his advice for metabolism and he made changes for me because I didn't eat all the things he had on there, it became magically, unknowingly, a plant-based diet, but mostly raw, very specific ingredients that we can talk about. And, uh, and within three months, for the first time since my diagnosis, which at that time was 12 years, I was 28. For the first time ever, I was negative for lupus. And my chronic kidney issue went away. I no longer had protein in my urine. My high cholesterol went away. I had had many strokes in medical school from blood clot antibodies. They went away. And uh, this year, in next month, um, when I get my, that, that'll be, um, it'll be 18 years that I've been lupus free with zero relapses. And that wow. is, that is how this all began is that's amazing. Right? Stumble, right. fall in love and stumble into something. And then next thing you know, uh, then we have a, a new purpose in our world. Yeah. I mean, your story is incredible. Um, I, I'm very impressed with your husband, actually. I, I kind of have a history in that, you know, fitness, muscle building, bodybuilding world. Um, I was heavily involved in that, uh, you know, 30 plus years ago. And it was, you know, just kind of this religion that you had to just have tons of animal protein. So I'm really like your your uh, husband kind of broke the mold, emphasizing all the plants. I'm very well, impressed. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was not he never intended to become plant based or vegan in any way. Mm -hmm. But so he comes from a background of computer science and mathematics. So we both went to a very nerdy school called Carnegie Mellon 
where people go to just, we want to be the best scientists. We want to yeah. learn from people who are changing the game and, and innovating. And it was a really cool place. I loved that place so much. Um, so I was there for uh, biology and chemistry and also creative writing. And my husband was there for computer science and mathematics. And at the time they were number one in computer science. Uh, I, now I think they're tied with MIT, but he hmm. has one of those minds, extreme analytical, and he believes there's a correct algorithm for everything, which can make it fun when you're deciding which way the toilet paper should go or anything else. My husband has a system for everything. Me, whichever way it goes, I'm good, right? So right. he's always got a system. And it's because of his mindset that he really came into this saying, okay, he, he ended up getting his master's looking for these answers in exercise science, health promotion, and even PhD researchers could not tell him mm -hmm. the proper diet for human metabolism. It was just, it made him so angry because in, in mathematics and computer science, there's always an optimal solution. He calls it an elegant solution. The one best way. There's always one best way, right? It's kind of like when you do a proof in math. Whenever I do a, did a proof in math when I was in school, I would always get the right answer, but it would be a page long. He'll do it in three lines, you know? Because <laughs> I take the scenic route. I find it, but I... He always will find and pinpoint the optimal way. And so when he moved into fitness, there was no systems. There was no algorithms. It was just, it was just, you know, some people were better like this and some people were like better like this. And he goes, how is this science? So he applied this mathematical algorithmic systematic brain to nutrition. He said, fine. I'm going to figure it out. So he started working with different kinds of scientists. One scientist who he worked with designed supplements from one of the top supplement companies. And he said he would test people's blood for what they're, they're deficient in. Most humans are deficient in minerals followed by vitamins, only followed by vitamins because some people take multivitamins. But he said, well, okay, well, where would these minerals come from? Where would these nutrients come from? And so then he started looking at what has the highest dose of these things. Well, cruciferous vegetables have the highest doses of things. Okay, what if I superdose people in cruciferous vegetables? I wonder what would happen to their metabolic rate. And what he found is they would lose fat faster. They would build muscle faster. He said, cool, that's great. Then he started learning about things like omega-3 fatty acids. I learned about them in med school, but minimally. He started looking at how would that affect metabolic function and fat loss and all of these things. So he created this system and it worked so well. He was on TV talking about metabolism. He was uh, on MTV. He was training people for MTV for their music videos because they needed a six pack in three weeks, he could do it. So when he applied his techniques for food to exercise, exercise just worked so much better. So I wanted that. But at the time, he was also still giving people free range meat because he thought they needed meat for protein. So he hadn't gotten past that hump yet when he met me. And um, and so I had been a vegetarian since I was like 12 years old. So I would not eat any meat. And so he had already figured out it was, I mean, it's very similar to what paleo is now, but that wasn't a thing back then, right? So he um, So he'd never trained a vegetarian. And he mm -hmm. went, okay, if you won't eat meat, then you, we got to stop with the dairy and the eggs because that saturated fat will impede your ability to lose fat. Because mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be ripped for my wedding, you know? So he said, okay, that'll, that'll get in your way. So you have to take that out. So now I was no longer vegetarian. I was vegan, right? By accident. And then he said, okay, instead of meat, what if we try edamame and tofu since it's the highest protein plant food there is? Mm -hmm. So that was the first version and so I was mostly eating tons of raw vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, um, huge salads at dinner time, lots of guacamole to get everything down. Uh, he had me on a gallon of water a day, which is what he knew from fitness optimizes uh, body transformation. And so I did all of that, but without the meat. And so just like his other clients, I lost all the weight. I lost, uh, I went down from a size 11 to a size three in three months. I mean, I was ripped. And I was his first client to be healed. His other clients would get fit, but they didn't lose disease, mm -hmm. but I did. And so we didn't even realize at the time that it was from my diet, because again, as a, he'd never seen that before. And as a doctor at this point, I was never taught about nutrition. So it didn't even occur to me to consider it. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, oh, it's a marriage miracle. And it wasn't until I had my first son four years later that I'd been told by my doctors was impossible. I was told if you ever get pregnant, one, you probably won't be able to carry a baby. And two, 
if you do, I mean, you could have a stroke, you could have kidney failure. It, I was too sick to be a person who would qualify. Some people with lupus, yes, not me. And after four years of being 100% lupus free, I had a six pack. I was so healthy that we decided to do it. Well, I decided, he was terrified, but I decided. And after I had my son without a relapse and perfectly healthy, that's when we finally realized it. Two things happened. One, I had my baby and I was fine. I had a C-section because he was breech. He was butt first. He wasn't moving. So he came, he met the world butt first. Um, I recovered so quickly. Same day, I was walking around. I felt great. My doctor said I had an unusual ability to heal, which still gives me goosebumps because I couldn't heal a pimple <laughs> as a teenager, right? And then when I got home, nine days after I gave birth, I was back in my pre-pregnancy genes. So wow. my, my husband did a full photo shoot, which I still have, because he goes, this is going to be great for my fitness business. <laughs> and is when we finally realized maybe there's a connection between metabolism and health that we'd never realized. And so we spent time reverse engineering. For us, it's very important. We're, we're highly ethical people. So we do not believe it's ethical for people to just say, I did this and got healthy, do what I did. That's what most people do. And they don't know if they got better because of everything they did in spite of some of the things they did. And so for us, we needed to make sure that every ingredient we recommend was necessary mm -hmm. and that there was nothing superfluous and nothing that I just got away with, you know? Right. So we kept uh, working on it and testing it. I had volunteers I tested on it. And only when we got the same results with every person that they could reverse disease, the markers got better, arthritis went away. When it was universally, every person is getting better. That's when we brought it to the public. I wrote mm -hmm. my book by lupus then. And we also um, released it to the public. We decided that uh, that it was only right to release our findings and our protocols for free to the public so that anybody who wanted to get healthier could do it too. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, really interesting. And you know, it's all really compelling. Uh, when I read your book, there was a few specific questions that I feel honored that I can ask you directly. Okay. Um, you talk about the uh, importance of, you know, uh, omega-3s mm -hmm. and uh, particularly getting them uh, from plant sources, you know, so they get the ALA. Right. But uh, there's this conversation out there in the plant-based world about whether or not you should be taking supplemental EPA, DHA, uh, you know, through from algae. Mm -hmm. um, the concern being that some people may not be able to synthesize enough of those. But you make the point in, in one of your books about how it's better to just take the ALA so that you don't create too much of those. Could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so we've been studying the, the omega-3 pathways for a really long time. My husband actually taught the grand rounds for family practice at UCLA Harvard to teach doctors how this pathway works. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I'm very lucky to, to have his brilliant mind also that we've been studying this a long time. So a lot of people, they, they kind of read something about it. They make assumptions and then teach the assumptions. We, we really go the other way. We, we read it, we understand it, we test it. And then we decide based on those results, what's going to happen. But when it comes to the omega-3 pathway, it's one of the things that I, I enthusiastically teach doctors. I've taught rooms of doctors of 600 or more really to help them understand this pathway because it's so pivotal and important. And a lot of the assumptions that people are being taught are incorrect. So one incorrect assumption that's in Goodbye Lupus, it's also my online classes, I go through the pathways for people, is to understand that the idea that we can't successfully uh, turn the ALA into what we need, right, EPA, DHA, uh, that comes from previous studies where people who are also eating meat, dairy, other things were not always having a high rate of conversion. But what they discovered was that it's not that we can't convert it effectively. It's that the enzyme, delta-60 hydrogenase, the enzyme that breaks down both ALA and LA into the omega-6 or the omega-3 pathway, that that enzyme is used for both pathways. Mm -hmm. And not only that, so there's competition, but the other thing is it prefers the inflammatory omega-6 pathway. So if you are eating oils, if you're eating meat, if you're eating eggs, if you're eating dairy, if you're eating fish, if you're eating very high omega-6 sources, then you won't effectively convert it. But mm -hmm. if you're not, we have not seen there be an issue. And you know, when you look at also what would the symptoms be of someone who is deficient, well, they'd have higher inflammation, they might have 
thinking issues, memory issues, mood issues, right? Omega-3s are important for brain function, for memory, as well as inflammation, as well as your ability to recover and get a fast metabolism. We would see problems that we don't. So when it comes to the DHA, EPA, you can take it directly, right? If you want to use algae and take it directly, you can. One of the problems that I have with it, though, is that many of the supplements, most of the supplements that I've seen, they dilute the the EPA and DHA from the algae oil. They dilute it in another oil, you know, to make it kind of sustainable and, and bigger, right? Get a bigger dose. Most of the time it's diluted in sunflower oil or safflower oil, which oh. are from the high omega-6 oils. Right. So you're spending all this money to get this supplement, you got like this much of it, and it's already now ruined that it's higher in omega-6 and omega-3. So that's one of the issues. So if you do use an algae supplement because you want to hedge your bets, that's fine, but make sure that it's not diluted in an inflammatory oil. Uh, the other problem is people don't always get results from those oils. So I had uh, a, a doctor, so a lot of times when plant-based doctors get sick, they come to me because my understanding is not just about the general idea of plant-based nutrition of like, oh, avoid animal products and eat more plants, but very specifically how different types of foods affect cellular function. So I have a lot of my own clients and patients that are, are doctors and nurses and even pharmaceutical researchers who then when they get sick, know that I can help them. And so one of the plant-based doctors that I worked with said that she actually um, was giving one of these algae supplements that's from a trusted source. And she was giving those algae supplements to her patients. And then she tested their levels and there was zero change. Oh, they really? Weren't getting any better. Wow. So whereas they were getting better when she just put them on my hypernourishment protocol. So, um, so effectiveness matters. Um, and I, and I think both are important, you know, ALA is also really important. Um, people have been long studying and aware of the benefits of EPA and DHA on brain function, especially we know that that supplements increase IQ of children when they're, when the mother takes it while their kids are in utero. Wow. So, yeah. That's a pretty cool thing. My, uh, <laughs> as an aside, my gynecologist told me when I was pregnant that I should slow down because my kids were going to be unrelatable. <laughs> <laughs> they are really smart i didn't take the supplements i use the flax and chia flax oil and they both have uh, just you know mom brag but they yeah. are they have very high iqs they both have scored 100 percent on standardized tests for the state like they are just wow. really really high functioning kids um way smarter than me uh, or their dad uh, <laughs> so maybe the omega-3s had something to do with it plus they've been plant-based their whole life mm -hmm. which could potentially optimize their IQ. Um, but yes, so so effectiveness matters. And again, we're not seeing a downside where people aren't getting those results. So if you want to add it, go ahead. It might not work if it has omega-6. It also might not work because omega-3, see, you got me started. I will talk about omega-3 for hours. But yeah. omega-3 is extremely fragile. And omega-3 fatty acids, they will oxidize if they're exposed to heat or air. Mm -hmm. So if you take this oil, and you stick it in a capsule or something, and then you just leave it in a jar or something in your cabinet, how long is it going to take before the air oxidizes it and it's no longer active? If it's trans, if the supplement was shipped in a hot truck, which nowadays could be anywhere because it's hot everywhere. Right. You know, and so the inside of the truck is going up to 120 degrees. How active is the omega-3? So right. I think it's necessarily harmful if it doesn't have omega-6 in it, but we don't need to spend the money. Uh, and it's not necessary in terms of the results I have. So yeah. that's a long-winded response, but you asked me so. Well, there's... actually, I picked up a lot of nuances there I wasn't aware of. And I, my understanding is, you know, if you oxidize the oil, it's like worse than useless, uh, you know, potentially harmful. Um, the other big question in my mind, I you know, um, you talk about the raw foods. And I used to think, oh, raw foods, you know, just hocus pocus, but clearly you get results from it. And there's a cardiologist in Texas, um, uh, Montgomery Baxter, who's a big proponent of raw foods to really bring down the inflammation in the body, uh, you know, and stabilize, you know, inflamed, inflamed cardiac clock and stuff like that. So, you know, clearly there's something to it. Do you, do you, what, what is it about raw foods that's so special? Well, if you're asking me to come up with theories, that's always, so for me, theories can be wrong, but results mm -hmm. can't be argued with. Right. Uh, so whenever people ask me why raw foods, my main answer is because they work. So mm -hmm. time and time again, especially now, 
right? It used to be everyone who came to me was on the standard Western diet. But now a lot of the times when people come to me, they've been trying to get healthy for a while. And they're like, all right, let me see if potatoes work because that's much more delicious. Let me try and see if like beans will work. Let me try rice and all. So they try all those things and they go, ugh, I'm not getting better. They eat the cooked vegetables. Still, they're bigger than they used to be, but they're not vibrant. They still have some psoriasis, stuff like that. So then they come to me and I put them on, on you know, my goodbye lupus protocol. So we take out the cooked food, we give them the raw foods, we get the high omega-3, we get the water intake. And dramatically and rapidly, their, their symptoms get better. And it just doesn't work with the cooked food. I would prefer cooked food. It's much more palatable for most people. And I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm actually super laid back. It's the body that gives me the information. I'm just relaying it. But what's amazing is, especially for folks like me, you know, when people have been sick a really long time, to have something that quickly changes your health is amazing. And so my husband and I have done everything we could to simplify it such as green smoothies. All right, you don't want to eat pounds of raw veggies a day? Fine. Blend it with some fruit, throw the flax or chia in there, you put the water in, boom, now you got something that's really palatable. You put a straw in it. I just finished another one here. Um, and you can be nourished, work, and be better. Why is it? There's probably, there's, you know, there's a lot of theories out there, more intact nutrients, the cell walls have been broke, haven't been broken open. A lot of times if you're steaming or boiling, you break it open, the nutrients are now in the water. So there's, there's a lot of potential reasons. Uh, but what we do know is that the living foods seem to create more life and more quickly. So, um, you know, in, in my Goodbye Autoimmune Disease book, the foreword is by Ellen Joffe Jones who is a plant-based athlete. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. she, she's constantly going, do you know her? She does the marathons. And I don't know her, but I read it. Yeah. 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 And she's, she's awesome. And she's been plant-based for decades. She used to do the food demos for one of the other plant-based docs. I forget which one, but someone who's been around one of the old guys, right? So mm -hmm. she used to do plant-based. I forget which one. So they can't be mad at me for saying it, but <laughs> when she was doing, uh, she was doing food demos. So she knows this stuff. And she's a runner and felt fit and healthy. She had a little bit of belly fat she could never quite get rid of, but otherwise felt fine. And then suddenly in her 50s, she got psoriasis. And she was so upset. She went to um, Dr. Joel Kahn up in Michigan. And, you know, he's in the plant-based community there. And she goes, how do I have psoriasis? I have been plant-based for decades. I run. I don't understand it. And he just shot me a text message and said, fix her. <laughs> okay those of us from the northeast we talk to each other like that so it's fine so she made an appointment with me and i saw she was eating beans and potatoes and cooked vegetables tea but not that much water not really omega-3 sources so she wants she's wants to get better as quickly as possible so we put her on my full protocol all the raw food so i always let people know listen you can start by adding what you're missing and just add the smoothies and if that's enough like you said psoriasis is getting better beautiful then mm. keep doing that but if you want to go as quickly as possible, or that's not enough, just eat only those foods until you're better and then add back all the cooked foods, right? So what she did was she said, I'm just going to do the full plan. So she went fully raw and she was doing smoothies, salads. She was getting the omega threes in gallon of water a day. And in two weeks, the psoriasis disappeared completely. Yeah, that's and amazing. Elbows, everything. Yeah. And so it's a difference. So we had someone who's an established plant eater. Mm -hmm. but was missing that raw component the omega-3s the water the raw foods we add those things in and she's been symptom free for years now i'm trying to remember it was pre-pandemic so that always gives me like okay we got at least three years plus mm -hmm. and she's been able to maintain it so it really is just a fantastic thing that you can do it works well and it's simple so it's mm -hmm. easier for people to incorporate uh, yeah, I, you know, I, you're you're illustrating that there's a lot of nuance to the plant-based thing. It's not just about you know eliminating animal products and eliminating junk food. There's there's some nuance to this. Um, there's a school of thought in the plant-based world that you know smoothies are not a good idea because you're sort of pre-digesting this stuff and that you'll tend to overconsume calories. But I gather your experience is that you know people actually lose weight if anything doing this. Yeah, again, it's nutrition mythology. And actually, I've gotten everyone who said that stuff, uh, except one that I've never met, to completely change their story on this. All of oh, them. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> okay. Huh. Um, because it's just, it was another theory, but it wasn't based off results. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is a disservice. I actually, I, it, it, it upsets me just being really candid 
it upsets me as, as a former patient as well, when people kind of put forth theories that are incorrect, that could potentially damage or people or prevent them from getting well. And so when they would flippantly say, oh, smoothies aren't good for you, your sugars are going to be too high, you're going to gain weight, you need saliva enzymes, and they stop people from taking action on something that could quickly and rapidly give their health back. So mm -hmm. if people weren't going to get healthy on smoothies or people were going to get fat on smoothies, you know who would know about it? Mm -hmm. I would. I have now helped over 4,000 yeah. people get their health back. I was just looking at it because we were trying to publish a case series. They asked how many and I had to look. Right. I have done this so many times with so many people. Nobody's wow. become fat. I'm obviously not not big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, avocados don't make you fat. Smoothies don't make you fat. And, and it is an interesting idea. Yes, that we do have some enzymes in our saliva to help break things down. But uh, if you pre-digest it, you don't need them <laughs> mm -hmm. and the nutrition works. And actually not that long ago, um, I believe it was Michael Greger, Dr. Greger just posted about a study where they showed they actually measured it to see how do you absorb nutrition better as evidenced by your bloodstream showing nutrition. And they found that smoothies were absorbed better. People had higher nutrition levels when they drank a smoothie than when they ate the salad. And Dr. Greger is actually one of the converts I had because back when I first came out with them, I get to meet a lot of these folks frequently on the lecture circuit, you know? Yeah. So when I fir first met Dr. Greger, he was very excited about what I was doing. He's like, this is so cool, you should teach, you know? I said, yeah, I wanna do that. And he said, but, you know, I don't know about that whole smoothie thing. So, okay, mm -hmm. fine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then a year later, we were at the whole conference and, uh, and he came up to me and he said, talk to me about smoothies. I said, why? He said, I've been traveling around the world and people are coming up to me everywhere saying your smoothie saved their life. I'm listening. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So I started talking to him about it and he was really interested. And not long after he made his video of his favorite green smoothie. Right. Oh, Dr. Clapper's a good friend of mine. He said that originally. And then he's in my smoothie shred group on Facebook. Like, you know, um, uh, Dr. Esselstyn's wife called me to find out how much flax to put in a smoothie. So, oh, really? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Years ago. So, so it's just the internet's forever. So mm -hmm. when people say things, they can, you know, even if they've changed their mind, it's still there. But anyone who said they're not effective are either not doing what I'm doing but I haven't even seen that. It's that they haven't tested it. They're mm -hmm. trusting their own mind to come mm -hmm. up with these things. And what I've learned is that no matter how smart we are, we can't trust our own thoughts. We have to trust mm -hmm. ourselves. So yeah. yeah, I mean, this started again as a fat loss protocol mm -hmm. and it works like gangbusters for that. Uh, but what's more important to me is that it also just creates an incredible, incredible, Incredible health. And if you're if you're not sick, it just reverses the aging process, um, both externally in and internally. I like that I don't look 46. That's nice, but it's not as important to me as the fact that internally I am very young. Like I had my colonoscopy done because 46. Mm -hmm. And my GI doctor gave me applause. He applauded. He said, I've never seen anything like this before. He goes, your colon looks like you're a teenager. He said, whatever you're wow. eating is incredible. I have never seen a colon that healthy before. Wow, Until that's My amazing. husband's colonoscopy. Yeah. And it was also very bright. He didn't get the applause that I got. But yeah. it was it was like, it, it's exciting. Hey, listen, at my age, it's exciting that anything is a teenager in me. But <laughs> you know that that my internal organs, same with like my mammography, I got my mammogram done. They said, oh, the, your, your breasts don't look like you're your age. They're like 20 year old. We can't, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, cool. You know, unfortunately that meant I had to come back because they couldn't see clearly, but it's like my body that was dying 30 years ago is abnormally youthful and healthy now. Mm -hmm. And I'm drinking these things every day. So I've got yeah. to say, like, the results are holding is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, you know, you've made a convert of me and um, my health story isn't quite as dramatic as yours. But the way I stumbled into it, as I read Dr. Greger's book back in 2017, I was just blown away by all this knowledge yes. about the connection between nutrition and the top 15 causes of death. And uh, I had a super high cholesterol. My cholesterol was 330 and I was uh, pre-diabetic. I mean, I was in great physical shape. Um, you know, I felt fine, but you know, when I read that book, I thought, well, maybe I should do something about this. 
I was reluctant to start, internally no yeah. applause was happening. Yeah. Right. And I was very reluctant to take a statin because my father had a condition called inclusion by myositis that might have yes. been triggered by taking the statin. And he ultimately succumbed to that. So anyway, I, I did the diet. I, you know, went into the whole hog. Like I wasn't into the green vegetables at that time, but I ate a lot of potatoes and sweet potatoes and beans and corn and rice and that kind of thing. And with and I was pre-diabetic within four days, that was gone. You know, my blood sugar was 65, and I subsequently had my uh, cholesterol checked, and it had gone from 330 to 143. Um, and so, so I was just totally sold. Yeah, and my exercise capacity just skyrocketed. You know, my recovery, and, you know, I just went from being lean to even leaner. So after since that time, I've just been this huge convert. And I personally find it really frustrating that, you know, most doctors don't know anything about this and will even poo-poo it and give people bad advice like, oh, you can't have all those carbs. You know, we've got a we've got an acquaintance that has really bad heart disease. He's had stents and coronary bypass and whatnot. He's in his mid fifties, and we were encouraging him to take a look at Dr. Esselstyn's book, you know, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And then his doctor poo pooed it and says, oh, you can't have all those carbs. So it's frustrating. Uh, I think we're making a little bit. Of, we're doing a little Q and A thing uh, at our hospital, probably sometime in the fall try to educate some doctors, but uh, it, it's an uphill battle. Have you personally received any pushback from MDs about what you do? Not really. Uh, so it's it's interesting because I think for me, the way I came up, uh, MDs are usually just really interested in my story because most of them have never met someone who is as sick as me, who's as healthy as I am now. So they're kind of, it's not just another person in a white coat saying smart things you know, that they might've read somewhere. It's this lived experience. So even the first time I, I talked about it, it wasn't even a room of doctors. It was a room, uh, my husband teaches personal development. He's really amazing at that. And so he had pulled me on stage and we talked a little bit about my story. And I had a doctor was one of the first person who cornered me, you have to help me. My mother has lupus, this and that. So I think my, uh, my story and my openness about things usually, engender some some interest and hopefulness. I remember I, I was teaching at Kaiser, which is a hospital system in California, and they wanted me to teach. And one of the people there was a resident and he was sitting there with his, you know, like this with his arms crossed when I first got there. And I'm thinking the whole time, because I'm used to, I'm, I'm looking at eye contact and I, and I said, this guy shut down. And at the end he came up to me and he said, you just opened my eyes to something. I really, was not even willing to consider what you were saying, but I I can, I, I believe it, I feel it. And so I think there's multiple aspects. One, my story, two, I speak as a scientist. I'm not talking woo, I'm not just talking about things I read, I'm speaking specifically, I give cases to back up what I'm saying. And so it's more interesting. Now, there are definitely, it is, it's definitely difficult, I think, in the mainstream world, but better than it was. So when I first started teaching this years ago, I would get comments sometimes online or, or from people that would say, oh, this is nonsense and it's snake oil. I said, but I'm not selling anything. Here's the recipe. Go do it. You know, and I think that's the other thing that gets people. OK, well, she's just giving it away. Maybe we can try it and secretly find out if it works. Right. So. Uh, I, I think that as time has gone on, especially with the internet, with all these documentaries, I've been in a couple of documentaries, Eating You Alive, Disease Reversal Hope, that new doctors especially are open and learning. So I've taught medical students through the pandemic. I actually did a bunch of Zooms with different medical schools on in Australia and other places. And the medical students are inviting me to speak. In Detroit, mm -hmm. I spoke to medical students who invited me outside of their regular curriculum to mm -hmm. come and teach them. So this generation of doctors are more open. Then there's folks like us that discovered it along the way because we had our own health issues and we got better and went, oh, okay. I have a lot of doctors that come to me to get better and then they take that information with them. So it really is exponentially better than it used to be. And mm -hmm. I think that we have to really be excited about that because mm -hmm. listen, when, when I was in college, I thought the word vegan, I heard what it was. And I thought that was extreme. Meanwhile, yeah. like teaching Robbie, right? But, but I thought it was extreme and ridiculous. And yeah. if someone had come to me as a resident before I knew about this 
and told me, oh, I read Kale Can Fix Me, I would have left, not at their face because I'm polite, but into my head, like, oh, please. Right? I went to school all this time so you could tell me that Kale's going to work. And yet, it just kind of happens. So now I have a t-shirt that says, only Kale can save us now, you know? But <laughs> I, I, and so I'm very empathic to the doctors that are resistant because had this not happened to me, I would be like them too. Mm -hmm. That if if your medical school didn't teach it to you, if you had to work 80 to 100 hours a week learning and studying and passing tests and practicing procedures, all that stuff, just to be allowed to be a doctor, and they never mention nutrition, it can't be important. Right. So right. our brain just shuts off yeah. for it. If it had mm -hmm. mattered, they would have taught it. So it's a waste of time. And mm -hmm. there are some who still think that way, and they will think that way till they retire but there's a whole new generation of doctors that are open to something different. Well, to be, you know, maybe this will be a little bit cynical, but there's no money in kale, but there's lots of money in stents and pills and surgeries. Sure. Um, so oh, I don't know. I, I don't have that kind of view of people. I, I believe people become doctors because they want to help people. Oh, oh I think the doctors so, are all motivated, but the healthcare systems. Okay, you know, the system, yes. Because yeah. I, I, I hear a lot of times people would think that Doctors are paid to prescribe. I've never mm -hmm. been paid to prescribe a medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. fact, in my residency, we wouldn't even accept paid lunches from a pharmaceutical rep, not even a pen, because we wanted to make sure there was no you know, bias at all, that, mm -hmm. all that, that, that we're not paid to prescribe, and that most doctors, I believe, are altruistic. We want to help people, and that's why oh, there's I a agree with that. depression sure. in doctors, yeah. because you think you're going to save everyone, and then they all just keep getting sicker anyway, right? So the mm -hmm. system, though, the system, I agree, mm -hmm. that is broken, and you're right. There is no money in it. The, the largest you know, businesses that will control U.S. Mm -hmm. is going to be you know, meat, dairy, other agriculture, right? And uh, not kale, but like soy and corn. Right. Right, things yeah. that feed the animal industry and then pharmaceuticals, hospitals, and guns, but that's another topic. But it's just one of those things where, yes, there's a lot of money to be lost by the system. And and unfortunately, doctors are pawns of a system that they don't even realize. So no, I, totally I had to defend that because yeah. it's just it's it's you know, I know it's frustrating for patients. Um no, I totally agree I, with your viewpoint there. Um, in your book, you you go out on a limb and say something that's really quite outstanding, which is that you don't consider yourself in remission. You consider yourself cured. Yeah. Can you tell me why you think that? Well, I've been in remission many times throughout the 12 years I had with this. I was lucky enough to have remissions. And in my remission, it meant that what was killing me in the moment, it was no longer killing me. So mm -hmm. when I had remission, from my first remission was after two years of chemotherapy when the kidney failure stabilized. Mm -hmm. So I no longer was considering kidney failure. I still had protein in my urine that I was told was from permanent scar tissue damage to my kidneys that I would always have it. And, but I was no longer needing the same level of immunosuppression. They were able to stop the chemotherapy. I continued on with some steroids. So that was my first remission. Now in remission, I still had positive labs for lupus, DSDNA, ANA, all of those labs were positive. I still had arthritis. I took Celebrex for it. Celebrex was the only thing that helped my arthritis. And I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just saying that I tried everything. And when they said they tried to take Celebrex off the market because it was causing heart problems, I took all the samples from my rheumatologist's office because <laughs> if I didn't have it, I was gonna be in pain. That was in remission. I still had that kind of arthritis that I wouldn't be able to do all my work at school if I, I didn't have my pill, right? That was remission. So even in remission, I needed medication and I still had migraines. I took medicine for that. So my migraines would come really frequently too. So I still had symptoms. I just wasn't dying from the disease. And that was remission. Same thing with the blood clot antibodies. So in, in medical school, I started getting double vision and I ended up being diagnosed with a new type of antibody that wasn't attacking my kidney. They were still stable, but now was causing blood clots. And I almost died. I had a mini strokes. I had just, it, it was very bad. So then I was taking injectable blood thinners every day. And once I no longer had visible clots, I was in remission, but I was taking injections every day for blood thinners, but I was in remission. Mm -hmm. So- so remission with autoimmune disease is not being healed. It means you're stably sick. 
Mm -hmm. right? It's not like in cancer, when they say you're in remission, they can't find any cancer. In autoimmune disease, you're stably sick. I have been healthy for 18 years, healthy. Like there are no antibodies. My ANA is negative. The DSDNA is negative. My complements normal. I have no blood clot antibodies. My cholesterol that I was told was high because of my genetics in my 20s, not because I ate so much cheese and eggs, but genetics. My, mm. my doctor literally said, there's nothing but you can do but blame your parents, right? right. <laughs> my cholesterol is usually in the 150s. Um, my blood pressure is about 95 over 50 something. And it was always oh. 120 over 80 when I was healthy. And then when I had kidney failure, it was dangerously high. So on every measurable marker, I am unusually healthy and mm -hmm. I've never had a relapse. I've had two children. I've mm -hmm. gone through stress in my life and I've never had a relapse. So I consider myself a healthy person. Now, yeah. does that mean I could never get sick? No, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I've done everything that I can. And I do not consider myself as someone who has lupus. I consider myself as someone who had lupus. Yeah, I think it's totally valid to make that claim that you're cured. I mean, um, like I consider myself cured of pre-diabetes. Like people would say, well, you know, if you went back to your old ways, you know, you'd get it back. But the food was causing me to have insulin resistance. And so if I stopped that food, I, you know, I'm no longer pre-diabetic. Just like if somebody was had chronic arsenic poisoning, they were constantly being ex exposed to it. And then they realized that was a problem and stopped being exposed to it. And they would get better. Well, you don't say that they're in remission mm -hmm. from arsenic poisoning. They're cured. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, in the case of my prediabetes and your lupus, I think it's fair to say that you're cured. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I went back to my old ways, could I get sick again? I think it would take a really long time because mm -hmm. I didn't start showing lupus till I was 16. And I was eating my parents owned a pizza place. So I was eating pizza every day for lunch and dinner. I would pride of myself and being able to finish a bag of Doritos myself. So I think I would have to work very hard and very long to get myself sick again because I've been healthy for so long, but I do have the same genetic potential I did before. And so with the right set of circumstances, I could get sick again, but that will never happen. I will never do that. So, so yes, right now I am a super healthy person. So I have healed from this disease. Mm -hmm. If people get upset with that word, I say, fine, say I reversed it. But I once saw on a lupus website, and it actually said, I'm trying to remember which one it was, but it actually said that because lupus is incurable, wrap your brain around this, because it's incurable, if you had it and it goes away, you never had it. Oh, yeah. What? Because yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure for those 12 years of my life, I definitely had it. You know, I was chronically right. scaring my dog. They used to test me every month because they were always scared of me because I always came up with new things to try to kill me, you know? Um, and so, th but that's kind of how, how medical science is trying to justify all of this, where I think it's okay in medicine to say that somebody can heal. We would hope. Mm -hmm. And could you potentially relapse? It's like a smoker who gets lung cancer and then you, you get rid of the cancer, they get all their treatments and they're healed. They go back to, sm to smoking well, now they can cause it again. But, right. you know, it's kind of the example I usually give is type 2 diabetes is one of the most highly genetically transmitted diseases there are. Acquired mm -hmm. diseases, right? Mm -hmm. So acquired meaning you're not born with it, but you can get it. So mm -hmm. it's one of the most highly genetic diseases you can get. And yet, if you are a plant-based marathon runner and you have the genes for diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you will never get it. Right, right. So, so there's our genetics. And then there's everything else about our lives, our stress, our sleep, our mindset, our moods, and our foods. And all of those have an impact on whether or not we trigger those diseases. And for some people like myself, the food was the main thing. And for others, I'm a trauma specialist. I help people find the other reasons, you know, their neglect of their sleep, their stress levels, emotional trauma, depression. Mm -hmm. There's so many aspects that create illness and keep people sick. But when we take great care of ourselves, we have the potential to be healthy again. I always tell people, if you weren't born with this illness, your body knows how to be healthy. We just have to remind it and bring it back there. Yeah, actually, that was my next thing I wanted you to comment on was the psychosocial aspects of this thing that you talk about in your book. There's more to it than just green smoothies. And uh, I, you're a psychiatrist by training. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My, my hope was that, you know, I could teach people through my example how to live 
purposeful, happy lives, even if you're chronically ill. I never knew that I would end up being healthy. But what I found when I started putting people through my protocols early on, so the goodbye lupus protocol is all about the nutrition mm -hmm. and people who are otherwise happy, good jobs, good partners, and just got sick. The nutrition, usually in just a matter of weeks, they were already dramatically better, if not even in remission. Mm -hmm. And then I started encountering people with depression, anxiety, trauma, stress, and the improvement was slower. You know, and there was more ups and downs. And I realized, wait a minute, I know how to do this. So mm -hmm. I started using my skills at helping people release anxiety and depression and release trauma and, and learn the, the, what I know about joy, which joy is one of my things that I teach that was not trained in, it's not trained in psychology. It's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Stress tolerance, yes, but not joy. And so as I taught people how to be joyful and grateful, and release all of these negative moods, they got better just as quickly as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's what's really cool is that I, I have a rapid recovery program where basically people work with me every single day. So I can basically be that Jewish mother that everybody needs, right? Did you <laughs> sleep? Did you eat? How did you know? Did, you know, like I take care of them every day and I inspire them and I keep them focused and I solve problems for them. So they don't have to solve problems. They just eat what I say. They go play and have fun and I help them get through it. But what's been really cool about it is that people will tell me that the most profound change they experienced was not the fact that their disease went away, which it did, but that they are happy for the first time. I just talked to someone today who's a, a follow-up from my group. She's a psychiatrist who did my group, who didn't know how to have fun. She only knew how to work hard. And she said, it transformed her. She's happy now. She's, she's a better doctor because of it. And she wanted to talk to me more about that stuff. You know, um, I've had other folks like uh, Gerard who, who made a video for me who who reversed his uh, glaucoma in my group at 77 years old. Diabetes and glaucoma got reversed in five wow. weeks. Wow! And his video, he talked about how the best benefit he got was that he used to be a, you know, a, an irritable old man. And now he's a happy guy. Wow. So wow. it's yeah. and, and I really feel like it's one of the most profound things that makes us healthier, but also just makes life worth living is mm -hmm. our happiness level and our appreciation for our lives. Yeah, yeah. That mind-body connection cannot be uh, understated for sure. But, uh, well, you know, I could ask you questions for the next three hours and you don't have time and I don't <laughs> have time, but maybe we can do it again sometime. Uh, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and you're an inspiration. And uh, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, what's the best I'm way to connect? Yeah, I'm super active online. I mean, I'm I'm always trying to inspire and educate. And so mm -hmm. I have uh, on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, if you look up at Goodbye Lupus, you'll find me, Goodbye Lupus okay. everywhere, and GoodbyeLupus.com. So mm -hmm. oh, those are all places where you can see me. But I also, so every week uh, mm -hmm. on Wednesdays, I go live on all of my channels, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube to do Q&A sessions for the public. So people come from all over the world on all the different services and I answer questions along all of them and try to just as a public service. And it's been really cool. So if people want more help. It's every Wednesday at 1230. I go live 1230 Pacific. And it's really neat. Now I'm getting messages from people who literally are just coming to my Q&As and their diseases mm -hmm. are going away and they're checking in on the live Q&As. Oh, wow. Results. It's just super fun. So yeah, everywhere, if you look up Goodbye Lupus. Do you do you have like a waiting list to participate in your programs, like the uh, the recovery programs, the intensive recovery programs or so my rapid recovery group is my most popular one. That's six weeks of working with me every day. So that one, I, I do them every two months. And so they always okay. spell out. So right now, the last group of the year is September 21st. So we okay. have, we're down to one third of the spots. And so it'll probably sell out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, okay. And then the people will have to wait till January. So once this group is full, people will be putting themselves on the list for the first one of the year next year. So uh, so usually that's the way it happens is if people jump on it, they can get in. If not, they'll go into the next one. I have private four week rapid recovery programs where mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I have next spots right now, about two months out where people work with me one-on-one -on -one. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then appointments. So some people just wanna be able to meet with me and I give them personalized plan and coaching and my appointments are 75 minutes. So right now that's booked out a little farther, I think to January. Although I do. Well, that's rush that's off great that you're being so successful with this. I mean, that's fantastic. But yeah. um, but uh, anyway, so it's just been fantastic talking to you. Uh, perhaps we can do it sometime again in the future. 
Sure, and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased and uh, honored that you would take the time. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm always happy to spread the message and hope and information to help people get healthy just like we did. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, take good care. Okay, bye now. Thank you.